We've reached the halfway point of The Acolyte with its fourth episode. If its ending is anything to go off of, things are about to really kick off in the coming weeks, and I'm so glad we'll have four more episodes involving the Sith or the Stranger or whoever he is. That said, this episode went back to having an abrupt ending in the middle of an action sequence that just felt odd to me. I understand wanting to leave us all on a bit of a cliffhanger, but this is a little much. Anyway, we're headed to Kofar and the home of the Wookiee Jedi Kelnaka. He's living in a crashed ship, and like Torben, he seems overtaken with thoughts of the past. His walls are covered in markings that match the Witch Coven. Whatever happened there, he is not over it. From the trailers, I thought he would have been the one to take the Barash vow and not Torben, because usually Jedi go off and live alone when they do that. Maybe they both took the vow, but Torben still wanted to have a cook around or something. Back on Coruscant, May says goodbye to Jekki and the Jedi Order once again. She doesn't want to be part of the mission to capture May. I think she's having trouble reconciling her complicated feelings and the Jedi part of her might be bubbling up. Or I also wonder if she wanted to go off and search for May alone. The Jedi study hollows of May's fighting style, and they are unimpressed, which lines up with how she's acted in fights with Jedi, always seeming out of her depth. There's a familiar face in the room, good old Kiati Mundi, but he's still got brown hair at this point. I love that he is included in this story, since he is the Jedi Master to wrongly declare that the Sith have been extinct for a millennium in The Phantom Menace, and then say there's no way Dooku could murder anyone in Attack of the Clones. He's always so sure of himself, and he's almost always wrong. He is a symbol of Jedi overconfidence. Confidence. I repeated a joke from Joseph Scrimshaw a couple weeks ago about Yord potentially being Kiati Mundi's master, but now that I know Kiati Mundi is alive at this point, my headcanon is that Mundi taught Yord. The Jedi worry that May could be part of a Splinter Order of Jedi or something worse. The Sith started as a Splinter Order of Jedi thousands of years ago in the Hundred Year Darkness, but I like that nobody mentions that possibility here. Again, they are so sure they dealt with that problem nine centuries ago. Even Vernestra assumes May has been taught by a Jedi. And she also seems to know that Sol is hiding something about what happened on Brindok. I think it's very interesting that she doesn't want to tell the High Council what's going on. I kinda thought she was on the Council but she wants to keep this all under wraps so the Senate doesn't find out. It still really bums me out to see Vernestra acting this way. I'm familiar with her as a teenager in the books and comics, but there have already been some moments where we've seen her becoming less idealistic, losing some of the trust she holds in her superiors. I wonder if these scenes could be telling of how her story ends in the publishing side of things. She's worried about scandals creating fear and mistrust in the Order. I could see the Jedi going through something like that in the books, affecting how they act here a full century later. I like that Vernestra does show some compassion for May, asking soul why he didn't tell her there was a chance this poor girl survived, and now we twist things back on him. He says there was no way someone could have survived a fall like that. He was so sure. But he had to run Osha out of there for reasons we don't know yet, because he and the others must have done something worth keeping a secret. Vernestra admits that she thinks there's more going on and that May is probably just a small part of it. This is way too early to speculate on, but... I'm going to anyway. I kind of like the idea that The Acolyte could become a mystery thriller anthology. Leslie Headland has talked about the potential for multiple seasons, so what if every season follows a different Acolyte, a different person manipulated by this or multiple Sith, a different mystery, a different set of Jedi investigating? I don't know, could be cool. Sol pulls Osha back into the mission, using her as bait to get to May, which he is honest about. He truly does seem to care about May and what happens to her. That's what I think and want to believe right now, but I think it's also possible he might want to make sure nobody finds out the truth of what happened on Brindok from May. So they join the mission team, which might also include Plo Koon, and also this cute little otter man named Basil who acts as their tracker and guide. On the way to find Kelnaka, Osha asks Yord to kill May if she's unable to stop her, which I find to be a little suspicious. Is Osha hiding something too? I don't know what, but I also don't know why she would want her sister dead at all, especially when she hesitated to even stun her in episode 2. And in the very next scene, she feels some guilt over causing the death of a very creepy critter in the forest. She blames herself for disturbing this giant bug, but it was Sol who killed the creature. People make jokes about how un-Jedi it is for Cal Kestis to be running around slaughtering animals in the Star Wars Jedi games, but it is true. Sol went straight for his saber, killed something, and kept on marching, leaving Osha to feel the guilt. I could see that becoming symbolic of their past. But I enjoyed Jekki's comforting words to Osha, that we are defined by what we survive, not by what we lose. I think the true meaning of a Jedi becoming a Force ghost is that they are simply remembered. Their teachings live on. As Yoda says of students, we are what they grow beyond. When someone close to you passes away, 
of course it's okay to be sad about the loss, but you can also mourn their memory by surviving them, carrying them with you, and remembering how they changed you. Meanwhile, Chimir and May reach Kofar to begin their hunt for Kelnaka. Chimir acts like a bumbling fool, knocking stuff over and acting like he's there to help May, and I do not buy it. He has been my number one suspect for the red lightsaber-wielding stranger since we heard him say peace is a lie in the trailer, and he tells May that Osha's survival doesn't change the deal she's made with the stranger. He is absolutely manipulating her. He continues to do so as he asks May why she thinks she has to kill a Jedi without using a weapon and what that could mean. He might actually be curious, or he might be trying to push his student to learn and figure things out for herself. But she brushes it off and asks Chimere questions about his relationship with their master, which he avoids and instead brings up Soul just to prod at her. Eventually, she circles back to the question of killing a Jedi without a weapon. She can't figure it out because she can't make a Jedi kill her when she's unarmed. I think her master means you have to kill the Jedi metaphorically, break them down, use their shame and past mistakes. That's my guess, but I think we will have a definitive answer to that question by the end of the season. Unfortunately, I expect Soul will be the example made because we know he's got something to hide. Right now, May thinks it's impossible and Chimere, again acting kinda like a teacher, encourages her. But she's able to trap him when he goes off to look for water, realizing that she doesn't want to kill the Jedi anymore. That surprised me, but I like it. This whole time, May's master has been manipulating her grief over the loss of her sister. But if her sister is alive, then that pain is gone. Her master's power over her isn't as strong, and she thinks she can avoid prison by turning herself in and telling the Jedi what she knows. I would guess she has heard the word Sith at some point, which would be something her master wants to avoid. But she tells Chimere their master can only kill her if he finds her. And I mean, I think the ending strongly implies that Chimere is the dude in the mask. He acts like a fool, but that's the Sith for you. They deceive. Palpatine acted like a kindly old man. I wonder if Chimere recently killed or soon wants to kill his Sith Master, and he's using acolytes to find a new potential apprentice, helping them out, guiding them along. Chimere said their master collects people. And then the stranger just so happens to appear right after all of this. It's either Chimere or he has been an excellent red herring. As the two storylines converge, Soul stops as if he's feeling something through the Force. He did the same when Torben died. I think he might be feeling Kelnaka's death. Whatever he felt, it pushes him to promise to tell Osha more about their past once they get back to the ship, but by then it'll probably be too late. I will say I'm pretty bummed Kelnaka died off-screen. We've been talking about the difficulty of killing a Wookiee for multiple episodes, and while it was a chilling image to see him with a fresh lightsaber wound across his chest, I wanted to see Kelnaka in action. I think we will in flashbacks, but I was hoping to see more from the character. Speaking of chilling images, the Master's introduction was rad. The way he floated down behind Osha and slowly approached, that mask rocks and I was sufficiently terrified. I thought he had killed Osha when he ignited his lightsaber. But maybe he sees something in her. If I'm right and that is Chimere, he probably knows the whole story, and he got up close and personal with her already. If he's on the hunt for an apprentice and May has decided she's out, if she won't turn to the dark side, Perhaps her sister will. I think that would be a cool arc if the Dark Sister and the Light Sister traded places. But of course, we'll have to wait because the episode ends so fast right as the Stranger unleashes his full might in the Force. On the one hand, I'm so upset that it ended like that, but on the other, I am hyped to know the next episode will start off with some insanity, or we might have another flashback episode. I don't know, but whenever we go back to Kofar, it's gonna be crazy. And whichever direction the next episode goes, I'll be happy. I want to follow up with the Sith attack, obviously, but I'm also very curious to see more from the past. But that's all I've got to say for this week. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel to keep up with all our Acolyte coverage, follow us on our socials, and consider checking out our Patreon page, where we're releasing video reactions and audio commentaries for every episode as they come out. As always, thanks for watching, and for light and life.